Thank you. Um, well, my talk is going to be very straightforward because the answer of why humans travel uh, is actually one word, and that is curiosity. That is Aristotle, and Aristotle said, all men by nature desire to know. All men by nature desire to know. More recently, this man is Alistair Hardy, who was professor of zoology in Oxford in the 1960s, and he had the view that out of this process of evolution from somewhere has come the urge or love of adventure in man that can drive him to risk his life in climbing Everest or in reaching the South Pole or the moon. This was before the moon landing, actually. Is it altogether too naive to believe that this exploratory drive, this curiosity, has had its beginnings in some deep-seated part of animal behavior which is fundamental to the stream of life? Well, I believe it is. Of course, all animals are curious, and all animals uh, have to travel for food, shelter, and water, and a mate. Not so far for a mate. And we've been doing the same all the time. But there's one difference between all animals and ourselves, and that is we are able to exercise our curiosity better than any other animal. This is a dragonfly, which has some of the largest eyes you could imagine. It's not, our curiosity uh, is not exercised because of our large eyes, nor because of our smell. That a bear has a 2,000 fold better sense of smell than we do, nor because of our uh, herring, a um, tiger. You see, uh, the, uh, there he is, you see these ears actually rotate like a radar dish, and so it can pick up sounds far better than we can. No, our nearest relative, the chimpanzee, with which we share all our genes, but on some of those genes, uh, various mutations have occurred over the last six million years, which was when the common ancestor of chimpanzees and ourselves lived. And I'm going to delineate three crucial changes that made us able to be more curious and search more than any other creature. And the first is the arm. These are scaled to the same, uh, to the same length, but of course a chimpanzee's arm is relatively much longer. But I want you to focus on this human thumb. The human thumb, some people say, has been at the root of all technological innovation over the last two million years. For example, the thumb and the hand, we can use the precision grip, to, whether it's to take out a kidney or tie up our shoelaces. A chimpanzee uses the power grip when he's eating a banana. The development of the hand, the thumb and the other bones in it, took place because man had started walking upright. It was actually one of our predecessors about three, four million years ago, a species called Australopithecus, meaning southern ape, uh, living in the Rift Valley um, of East Africa. The Rift Valley stretches from Ethiopia down to Lake Malawi. And uh, there are footprints showing that Australopithecus was already walking upright it was an ape, three to four million years ago. The first Homo species uh, is generally thought to be Homo habilis about two million years ago, by which time we were using tools. So the hand is absolutely crucial. The second thing, of course, is the voice box, the larynx, and the difference is very slight, actually. A newborn 
child is very much like a newborn chimpanzee. It can't, it whimpers, chimpanzees whimper. A newborn child, like a chimpanzee, can breathe and swallow at the same time. Try breathing, breathing and swallowing at the same time. We can't do it. We lose that capacity at three, four years of age because we develop the larynx a little, the vocal cord is a little lower down, a little lower down in females, even lower in males. And that slight development, again, just a very minor genetic change, uh, has meant that we have speech. We're the only species that has speech. I mean, I know dolphins communicate, parrots speak, but not to the extent. It's been the basis of social, social life, which many people now think is a characteristic of humans. And the third thing, of course, is our brain. Um, our brain, this is actually not on here, this is Neanderthal, which is about our size, is about three times bigger than that of the common precursor of ourselves and chimpanzees six million years ago. And the chimpanzee brain has not changed very much. It's an extraordinary thing that actually uh, human brains and human development generally has been much faster over the last six million years than that of chimpanzees. The important thing about the brain is the cortex at the top, this part here, which in a human occupies most of the brain. In other animals, other parts are predominant, as I showed you in the um, bears, for example, the capacity for smell is greater and enhanced, and the eye of the, the visual part of the dragonfly and so on. But the brain, three times more neurons, that's nerve cells in our brain, you might think three times as many, but that has made a crucial difference. So uh, we have about 100 billion nerve cells in our brain, same number as the stars in the Milky Way. And each of those uh, is connected to thousands of others. So the complexity is enormous. And it is probably different in every person on the world because it, 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 is, it comes about willy-nilly. There doesn't seem to be any plan laying down specific neurons. And so some people happen to be born clever and others not so clever. Anyway, so as a result of those, that ability to exercise our curiosity, we have traveled to an enormous extent. In fact, we've traveled all over the world. So here are just some of the uh, timelines of our travel across the entire globe. Whereas our nearest relative, the chimpanzee, is largely restricted to an area here in West Africa and these areas in Western Central Africa. Chimpanzees, of course, animals, if they're curious, they will start moving out of their environment. A chimpanzee couldn't do it because humans have now destroyed the forest and so on. He couldn't do it if he wanted to. And in general, animals cannot survive outside their environment. That's the difference because we are able to make the environment adapt to us. Now, there are occasional stories, for example, the ancestor of today's camel about uh, 20,000 years ago, actually it started in North America, believe it or not, camels, and they wandered, and I say to you, why does an animal go outside its range? Well, it's curious, I want to see what's going on, Provide, or it could be searching for food, wandered across the Bering Straits when it was still a land bridge before the uh, last ice age stopped, but of course in the direction opposite to the one that humans took to inhabit the Americas. And there's an example of some lions that moved out of Africa about 20,000 years ago, the same time as humans, because all humans originated in Africa, the same time as Homo sapiens, now by now Homo sapiens, was moving into Europe. And some of these lions finished up in India. Most of them became extinct, but there are a few left in a uh, nature reserve. And Wilfred Thesiger, who was a great traveler, uh, when he walked up Kilimanjaro, he found a dead dog. And the answer is, well, why did he go to Kilimanjaro? It was probably curious, it got there, but then he didn't know how to escape the cold and it just died. So, 
Um, that's the extent of travel. And one of the most prolific travelers, almost 200 years before Columbus, was curious to see whether he could reach India and China by traveling westwards instead of eastwards, because he had heard that some people thought, actually, the Earth is round. And he thought, well, maybe he can prove it. So 200 years before, Ibn Battuta, who was a Muslim scholar living in Tangier, traveled all over the world, I think out of curiosity. Well, it is true to say that he, um, on his first journey, he went around here, several visits to Mecca. So part of his visits were religious. He did the Hajj. Um, but he traveled around. Uh, and his predecessor, you will immediately say to me, well, Marco Polo traveled all the way to China as well. Yeah, indeed he did. I think Marco Polo traveled largely for work. Obviously. He wanted to work for the emperor of China, and he did. So he traveled out and he traveled back. But um, even Batuta traveled around here on one of his voyages. Then he came around here, the east coast of Africa. Then he did, traveled all the way around into the bottom end of Russia, around here, all the way to China. His curiosity did not only extend to travel, it also extended to the human form, particularly the female form. So for example, while he was in the Maldives alone, he married six times which is the maximum number allowed by Muslim law, and lots of others as well. Um, and then finally, he came all the way back again and uh, went down to Africa. 70,000 miles in his life. Actually, it was most of his life. The need to travel. But there is no need to travel nowadays. You can sit in an armchair, and you can travel to the moon, you can travel on, up Everest, you can walk along the Grand Canal, you can do everything sitting in armchair. And yet, and you can have conferences, Skype and everything, yet why do the heads of big corporations, the CEOs, who lead very busy lives, spend most of the time on airplanes? I believe it is because they are visiting their staff and their um, competitors. They're curious to know how they react. They want to have a conversation one to one, even though you can do it, as I say, with modern technology. It's not the same. You cannot judge a person's reaction in quite the same way. That's why I believe um, many people still travel. And of course, work is one of the main reasons why people now travel. You know, I told you, work was the reason that uh, Marco Polo traveled such a lot. But if you can do all this, you can sit and you can watch programs here and there, and you can visually be in Istanbul and so on, and gradually people are beginning to be couch potatoes. And I think that symptom is the same as the dumbing down that we've seen in education in this country over the last 30 years or so. Dumbing down is the opposite of curiosity. And it loses us competitiveness. And if we're not careful, we shall finish up like the lotus eaters. You will recall, let us swear an oath and keep it with an equal mind in the hollow lotus land to live and lie reclined on the hills like gods together, careless of mankind. That is not a prescription for competitiveness with China and the other continents. So my conclusion is very simple. We need to continue to encourage young people to actually get out and do it, travel themselves, learn a language, 
go up Mount Kilimanjaro, and so on. And the best way to achieve that is undoubtedly through this organization, <laughs> which can then persuade government. Thank you.